Um, so just before we finished, we had started discussing, um, if I just flip the page back, we can have a look. And I'm starting having a look at what is included in a backup because if you're going to be migrating or upgrading your FME server, you're going to want to take a backup. Um, so we're having a look at what is included inside a backup and we've got a list here of those different components um, and also what is not included in a backup. So the next page that we're going to have a look at in this chapter is about backing up configuration files. So I did mention yesterday that this is something you don't want to back up with the intention of restoring it on your new installation. Um, you're only backing up configuration files to use as reference at a later date. So perhaps you've um, put in your database connection details and that's where you sort of got them written down and saved inside the FME common config file. You might want to keep that to refer to. Um, as part of the exercises yesterday, if you managed to get through it, you configured your FME server for HTTPS or SSL. So you maybe want to keep those Tomcat files backed up just as a reference for when you go through it again in the future, just in case you maybe want to see if you've missed anything um, or just see what settings or passwords you've put in the first time you did it. So just to repeat, this is very important. Do not copy config files and place them into a new installation and expect it to work. Um, so we've got this big warning here. Um, structure of configuration files may change between releases. Um, and more and more, we're trying to move configurations out of configuration files because no one really likes going in and editing configuration files. It's really easy to make mistakes. We're moving more things into the web UI. So you might find that between releases, things that you previously configured in a configuration file is now done in the web UI. So putting those configurations or parameters into a config file won't do anything um, in a new version of FME server. So depending on what you've done as well, configuration wise, you may not need to back up any of those configuration files. Um, so if you've just done a basic express install and left all the parameters and installations sort of as it is out of the box, if you're probably even not even going to be really aware of any of the configuration files. Um, but if you've done more to it, maybe distributed it, done those configurations that I've mentioned already, you may want to keep a copy of those. Um, so there is a list here of possible configuration files you may want to keep to refer to. Um, I'm not going to read all of these out. You would probably know as administrators when you're setting up your FME server what config files you're touching. Um, so then maybe it's a good idea to keep a record of that or keep a copy of these somewhere safe. And what I do normally find as well when we're on calls um, with customers that might be useful for yourselves, and when you're doing installations and configuring FME server, taking a copy of the config file before you even start editing it, just in case something does go completely wrong, you've got a sort of clean copy to replace just in case. So next we'll take a look at upgrading FME server. So there's a few different approaches to doing your sort of upgrade or your new FME server installation. Both or the multiple different ways have different advantages and disadvantages. So there is a table here that I've tried to make a little bit clearer what, the, what those advantages and disadvantages are between the different options. So the three scenarios that we've talked about here, you may upgrade FME server have a different machine ready to go, a different server provisioned, and then you're going to be using a different host name. So we talk through the options for that. And um, you may be upgrading to a second machine and use the same host name, um, or you might be doing an upgrade in place on the same machine. So if you're doing an upgrade in place and you're doing it on the same machine, unlike FME desktop, you can only have one installation of FME server per machine. So if you wanted to upgrade to the latest version, you would have to uninstall FME server, make sure like your Postgres database is removed, all of your sort of file share and stuff doesn't, it doesn't have anything left over from the original install. Make sure that's clean, restart your machine and then do the new install. So any configurations are gonna be removed, that instance is gonna be removed. Um, and then that will allow you to do the new install here. Um, so this will involve some downtime. 
Um, so this is what we're talking about here about um, is your FME server installation remain accessible without interruption? If you're doing the upgrade in place on the same machine, you are going to experience downtime for the duration that it takes you to get your new FME server installed and up and running. And it also carries the risk as well that if you bring this down and do the new installation and you do experience issues with install or configuration, you're going to be down for a lot longer compared to if you had a second machine where you could leave the old FME server up and running and users would still be able to access it until you're certain and happy that the new or upgraded FME server is available and ready to go and you've got everything working on it. Um, so if you are going to be doing an upgrade and you know which scenario you're going to be using, it's probably worth having a look through this table uh, before you start the upgrade process, just to be aware of any risks or things to be aware of before you start it. And if anybody here is sort of a more experienced or um, has been using FME server for a lot longer, we used to allow engine only upgrades. Um, but since 2018, I believe the way um, FME server is done in the back end now with a new fault tolerance, we don't support engine only upgrade anymore. So if you wanted to use the latest version, you need to reinstall FME server completely and make sure it's on the right build. You can't start upgrading engines only. Everything needs to be on the same release. So that's just to know if you are experienced FME server user. So there is an exercise in this chapter um, for backup and migration, um, but because as part of one of the earlier exercises um, that Richard took you through yesterday with changing the database provider, um, we're not actually going to be doing this exercise um, because you did take a backup as part of that exercise and restored it with a new database when that was set up. Um, so I'm going to trust that that was the easy bit of the exercise yesterday for everyone. And so we'll just have a look. And one of the things that is mentioned in here that isn't covered in the exercise from yesterday is about backing up log files, potentially, if that was something you're interested in. Um, so some people may want to take a copy of log files before they take down their server and install the new one. So you can find your log files in the web UI. And this is something that Richard did show yesterday with um, doing the troubleshooting for the database configuration. Um, so if you want to find the log files in the web UI, you'll go to resources, click on the logs option, and then you've got a list here for core, engine, queue, service, and Tomcat. So depending on what logs you're interested in backing up, um, you can just go into the folder. I'm not going to current, um, the core folder here. And you can just select, I'm just picking some at random here, but you could select which log files you maybe wanted to back up. And then you can choose to download those. And it will just zip those up for you and download them. So you can keep those as a copy. Or you can go, if you're gonna be making a copy of a lot of log files, it's probably easier just on the machine to go into your file explorer and then go into where your FME server system share is. So I want to go to program data and then inside here you've got the resources this is where the resources actually live so you can go inside the logs folder inside your file explorer and then copy them make a backup directly from here as well so you've got two different options and as well through the file explorer is where you would go and copy any configuration files should you wish to keep a copy of those for reference so I believe that's the only difference in this exercise compared to doing the backup and restore as part of changing the database provider that you did yesterday. So the last um, section in migrating your FME server doing upgrades is on projects. I say projects is also covered in the server authoring course, I believe. So this is just a way, it's kind of like a mini backup in a way. So you can use a project to group together different items or components on FME server that possibly share a common solution or what you would call a project. 
Um, so you can group these different items together, save them up, and then you can reference them as one easy object. So you can export and import projects to FME server. So if you wanted to move maybe between like development and production machines, if you've got that kind of setup in your organization, you could build all of your things on development, put all of the things that you need into a project, and then export that and import it then on your production machine. Or maybe you're doing an upgrade and you've got two different servers on the go. Maybe you don't want to do a full backup and restore because your server's got a bit messy. There's a lot of things on there that you don't need to carry over. You could just put the things that are important to you inside a project and then migrate those over to the new server. So some of the things that are included inside a project, um, you've got workspaces, custom formats, custom transformers, any templates, any automations now from 2019, repositories, schedules, notifications, resources, um, cleanup tasks, database connections, web connections, users, and you can also include a project inside a project. So you can get a little bit inception in there. So I can show you as well on the left hand side here, you've got projects on the menu bar near the bottom. Uh, so when you click on projects, I don't actually have any on this machine, but you can click on here, you can build a new one and give it a name, give it a description and a readme as well if you want, so you remember and know what's in your project. If you're sharing this project with someone else that maybe needs to get up and running and you need to give them instructions, it's a good idea to include them in the readme. Um, and now we have Markdown editors, or oh, I think it's similar to Markdown, maybe not quite Markdown. Um, text editors here, so you can make the formatting a little bit nicer. And then when you want to add items to your project, at the bottom you've got this contents dialog. So you can just click on the add items button. And you've got a drop down list of all of the things that you can include inside a project and choose what you want to add basically. So I could just go and add in that samples repository because I know that comes with FME server installs and OK. And you can always come back to a project later and add it, um, edit it and add more things or take things out of your project. There we go, and that project is saved. So if I wanted to export this project now, um, you can just select it and you've got the option up here to export it. And then if you wanted to import a project, if you had one, you can click the import button um, and it will give you some options. You can drag and drop the, it will give you an FS project file when you export a project. You can either upload that here or drag and drop it onto the browser. Um, and then you've got a few different options. You can overwrite existing items. If it's got notification systems in there, like publication subscriptions, you can choose to pause those when they get imported. So you can go and enable them when you're ready. Um, so you've got a few different options there before you do the import. And then as administrators, you might be interested in some history here to see what has been imported or exported from your system. So you can have a look at the task history here and that will give you that information. And there is also the option to exclude sensitive information. So if you've got things like passwords or web connections inside your workspace, um, it should, when the next person imports that project, they will need to use their own web connection, for example. Um, it's not gonna share passwords unless you select that exclude, inform exclude sensitive information button. Um, so you can migrate projects for other users if you are logged in as a super user or if you're assigned to that FME super user role. Um, so if you can include users in a project, you can back up and restore a project for those users to work on on another system. And any permissions that that user has on the current system will then be granted on the system to which the project is restored. As long as, as, long as the permission is on an item in the project, Obviously, you can't have permissions on an item that doesn't exist on that new server. And the permission was granted to the user directly rather than through membership in a role. So we're going to touch on roles and users and that in the next chapter, if that isn't quite clear now.
And then viewing and editing projects, we've just had a look at that where you can go and create your projects and add things to them. And then now in 2019, what you can do is export your projects to the FME Hub. So if people here are um, familiar with FME Desktop and Custom Transformers, you're probably aware that there are sort of custom transformers that you can download off the FME Hub. And you can also build your own custom transformers to publish up to the hub um, if you want to share them with other people. So now we've made this available for FME server projects. So I can open this link in a new tab. Um, and you can see here, there's a few projects up there at the moment. Um, this is still fairly new for 2019. Um, so I think some of the experts here have been doing a lot of work with CityWorks. Um, so I'm not too sure what's in this project, but if you're interested in CityWorks, you could go and import this project to your FME server. If you use Azure or Microsoft Graph, you can import those projects. Um, so basically, if you've done anything interesting or cool that you think would be useful for other people on FME server to use, you can export your project and upload it to FME Hub. And there are a few extra parameters that you will need to set when if you want to export to FME Hub. So you can see here there's an extra dialog box here um, called FME Hub optional. And then you can go in here and you would put in your FME Hub publisher ID. So now if you're putting items on the hub, you should be doing so as a publisher, which is kind of like a name for a group or an organization or a person. Um, you would have a publisher ID, so you would put that in here. And then you would give it a hub project ID, which I believe is just a unique value, kind of like a name. Put that in there and you can give it an icon as well. So you can see here you would give it an icon, which is what would appear here. And then once you've done that, you can export it and then that would allow you to upload it to FME Hub. FME Hub would accept that project. So that's the end of that chapter on migration and upgrades. Uh, so hopefully at the end of that, you're, you now know what you can include in a backup. Um, you know how to create a backup and do a restore. Um, you're aware of what projects are and what you can keep on a project, how you would create, export and import your project. Um, and as well, knowing about like log files and configurations if you wanted to make a copy of those for reference in a new install. So now we'll move on to chapter four, which is FME server user administration. So at the end of that chapter, we were talking about users and roles. Um, now we'll go into a little bit more detail about what we actually mean by that. So FME server security is based on two concepts. So you have users and you have roles. So users will be the individual accounts that access FME server. So everyone here has signed in as the user admin to their FME server. Um, so when FME server is installed, default user accounts are created. Um, so one of those is the admin account that we've signed in as here to use our accounts. Um, there are others like guest and author, I believe, that you can also sign in as. And then roles are comprised of one or more users. So it's a way of sort of grouping permissions together. So for role-based access, um, this makes it easy to assign the same set of permissions to multiple users, depending on their job function. So perhaps you've got people that um, only need to do specific things on FME server. So you may have a group of people that probably maybe don't know how to use FME desktop. They're never gonna be building workspaces but they need to be able to run workspaces. So you might give someone like that FME user or FME guest permissions. As you can see here, those are some of the roles that are available. So they wouldn't have permission to publish workspaces up, do any, do any editing on here. Um, they would actually have a very blank view in here and they would probably just have access to run a workspace and access to any repositories that they need access to. Then sort of like the next level up, you may give someone or make someone part of the FME author role. So this would be someone who is building workspaces, publishing them up to FME server and configuring them so they will run correctly on FME server. 
And they may also build automations or use the notification system to set up those automated workflows or set workspaces up to run on a schedule. And then the next level up from that would be the FME admin. So these would be able to carry out administration tasks. So maybe they would be configuring job queues. Um, they might be doing anything sort of in this bottom panel, which is most of the things covered in this course. Uh, so for anything for the author, you would probably want to look at the FME server authoring course to see exactly what authors can get up to on FME server. And then the last sort of role on FME server, which is like the most powerful role there is, is the FME super user. So this gives a user unlimited access to the system. Um, you do have to be a super user to do the backup and restore tasks because um, you wouldn't want anybody going and doing that. Um, so they basically have everything an admin can do, but everything. So by default, the admin account that is created with FME server that we're signed in as now is a super user account. So before you assign anyone that super user permission, make sure that you know that they know what they're doing and that you trust them to have that power over your FME server. And I mentioned earlier on install, FME server does create some default accounts. So the admin, uh, which we're familiar with, is assigned the super user in the admin roles. There is also a default author account, a user account, and a guest account. And they've been assigned the roles that match their username. So you can create any role that you want, or you can create any user that you want as well, and assign different permissions to those roles or to those users. So you can assign a user permissions outside of a role, so they can have both um, types of permissions. And I'll actually have a look in a moment at that user security option, so you can see what is possible. Um, so if you wanted to configure this under the admin section on the left hand side you've got security and then under security you've got the option for users and for roles so we can have a look here and click on roles and we can see those roles that we were just discussing so we can have a look at the user role and compared to we'll compare it to the super user in a moment and see how many see what the difference in permissions are um, so you can see that an FME user only has access to run a workspace and access jobs. So they'll be able to go in here, run a workspace, and then be able to check the status of the jobs that they've run on the jobs page. And it looks like scrolling down, that's pretty much it. That's all the FME user can do. So now if we go in and have a look at the super user, um, oh, I don't wanna grant that to anyone. I want to have a look at the role. Have a look at the admin role. You can go and see where is the user before only had those two selected. Um, you can see that the admin now gives all of these permissions here. So you can see that they have a lot more permissions available. And you can click on users as well and see what permissions they've got. So I can click on an author role. And you can see it's got that same sort of security dialogue permissions view, so where you can see what they do have permission to do on here. So FME server can determine if a user can access a resource, um, whether the user owns it. If the user owns it, they created it, they will have access to do it. Or you can give other people permissions to it. So you can see in here with things like resources, you can drop down and show the resources. So I would be able to give another user different permissions to different resources that they maybe don't own because they didn't create it. Um, so, yep, so even though a user is, if I go back and click on the author role here, or the author user, sorry, um, even though they've been assigned the FME author role, um, I could give them additional permissions, like administrative permissions. Um, so I could give them things like be able to manage engines and licensing. And maybe I want this person to do some of the cleaning up, set the system cleanup tasks. Um, so I can give them permissions that 
So I've exceed their FME author role, but I haven't given them the FME admin role. So you can sort of mix and match their permissions. I mean, I believe for those default accounts as well um, that were here. Um, so by default, when you install FME Server on 2019, the admin username and password is admin and admin or lowercase. Um, and you are encouraged to go and change that password once you've signed in to something that you will remember. Um, and then I believe it's the same for all of these. So it would be user, user is the username and user is the password. And then guest is the username, guest is the password. And author, and author. And you can also configure uh, permissions on items as well. So you don't necessarily have to do it in the users. You can go into the different items available here. So you can see my project that I created earlier. And if you wanted to share that with users, so they would have permission to um, either sort of view, edit, or access it, I can go and choose who I would want to share that with, depending on what users I've got in my system. And you could share it that way. And then I guess when you looked at that user then under their user page, you would see that they had permission to that project or whatever item you shared with the user. So security policies, um, we've kind of had a bit of a look at that on this page. This is what these all mean. Um, so I'm not gonna go through each and every one of these. Um, I think once you kind of get the idea about what access means, what manage means, um, it should be fairly clear when you're going through the permissions what, um, what you're giving people permissions for. Um, so where you see this access thing here on the first column, um, this means that they'll be able to see it in their sidebar here and have access to it. So for example, the user account or the, yeah, the FME user account that we had a look at only had access checked for run workspace and jobs. So if we signed in with that user account, they wouldn't see automation schedules, repositories, et cetera. All they would see on their sidebar would be run workspace and jobs because that's all they have access to. And if you gave someone permission to access something but not manage or create, they would be able to see it and go in here but if they try to do anything, if the links were available, it should bring them to a screen that tells them that they don't have permission and to contact their FME server administrator to get those permissions if they need them. So the create permission allows the person to create items. So for example, they would then be able to create an automation. I mean, things like manage for jobs, for example, if a user has access permission to jobs, but not manage, they'll be able to go in there and see their own jobs and see their own job history and what, if their jobs are in the queue. If they've got manage access, they'll be able to see all jobs on the system, depending on whatever user submitted them, they would be able to have a full view of like what's currently queued, what's currently running and what jobs have been run. Um, so if there is anything specific that you're interested in the permissions for, I would say check out the documentation um, and some of these have drop downs, things like resources, where there's multiple folders, you can go and assign more granular permissions depending on the folder in there. So you can see here, there's quite a long list of different things that you can control permissions for. <laughs> So now we've got an exercise here, um, which is exercise five. Uh, so this time we're gonna have a go at creating a new user. I mean, they're gonna, we're gonna make sure that they have limited privileges here. So they're not gonna have the full access that we have that you can see here. Uh, so in this scenario, the com your company has recently hired a new analyst who's gonna need access to FME server but they don't quite fit into the current FME server roles that we have in place. So those FME author, FME admin, et cetera, roles. So we're gonna to need to create a new role for them. 
So the first part of our exercise, if you haven't already got your virtual machine up and running um, and open, um, I would say do that. And then you'll need to connect to your FME server. So I haven't configured this for HTTPS or SSL. Um, so I've just put in here to access FME server, just type in localhost with a forward slash, and that would take me to FME server. If you did manage to get through the HTTPS SSL exercise yesterday, you may need to put HTTPS in front of here um, and then go to localhost. And that, that's not going to work for me. Um, but if you're having trouble accessing your machine, let us know in the questions. And as well, if there is anything that you wanted to go over later on in the training course at the end, if we've got time for either general questions or things from yesterday that you sort of had time to think about overnight, do let us know and we'll cover those off later on. And also you wanna be signing in using the admin, admin, username and password. This time under security, it wants us to click on that and then select users and we should see a list of current users. So at the moment your FME server should look like mine and there should just be four users in here. Um, and now we're going to create a new user. So at the top corner here, we've got a button that says new. You can select that. Then you're going to want to put in the username, which is new user. Um, and their full name is new user. And um, we want to keep their account enabled, sharing is enabled. Um, so you might see as well around FME server as you're going, these little tool tips. So if it's not quite clear, um, what they are, you can hover on them and it will give you a little bit more information. So we'll make their account enabled so they can sign in. Um, and sharing is enabled so they can share things that they create with other users. Um, their email address, this isn't actually a real person, so we don't have an email address for them. But if you do, um, well, hopefully you're creating user accounts for real people on your own FME servers. For those people, I would definitely recommend putting in their email address here. Um, we'll touch on password reset in a little bit, but it's definitely useful to have their email in as you go, as you're creating the new users, so you don't have to go back in at a later date potentially and spend time going through adding everyone's email address in. Um, but for this exercise, I'm gonna leave this blank. And then for their password, we want Password to be new user one with a capital N and a capital U. And it hasn't asked us to configure any assigned security roles yet. Um, so that looks okay. So hopefully everyone's typed in those details. Uh, so now we'll move to step three. Uh, so this now wants us to configure permissions. So that now that we've got the credentials for our new user account specified, we've put in their username and password, let's give them the right permissions for what features and items in FME server they need access to. So we're gonna select this load template button uh, just above all of these different items in FME server we can give them permissions to. I'm gonna click on that load template button and we can choose a role that we want to copy the permissions from. So we're gonna choose the FME guest role here, load that template. Um, so this can just make setting up these, um, so giving people permissions a bit faster if you can load a template and then edit. So we've added that template in, you can see they've got that run workspace and access jobs access. So now we need to configure these permissions to match the following. So we need to give them access to run a workspace, which is already done from loading the template. We need to give them access to the jobs, which again is also already done from loading in that template. And we want to give them permission to create schedules. So I'll select that one. And you can see it automatically gives them access permissions as well as create because they won't be able to create a schedule if they don't have access to schedules in here. And then we want to give them permission to create repositories as well. So I'll select that one and create projects. There we go. 
So even if you're following along, your security permissions here on the right hand side look the same. Um, so you should have run workspace um, and jobs with access permissions, schedules, repositories and projects with create permissions. So now we can scroll to the bottom and press OK to create that user. And you can see that they're now listed in here. So now we should test this user account to make sure that those settings have been honored. So we're going to sign out here. So to sign out, you're just going to click on that sort of user icon at the top right hand corner of the FME server web interface and then click log out. And then this time, instead of signing in as our admin account, we're going to sign in as that new user. So the username is new user with a capital N or a capital U or however you spout it when you typed it in there. And then the password we gave it is new user one. And that should let me log in. And you can see now that the permissions that we gave it are all available here on that left hand sidebar. So they only have permission to run a workspace, jobs, schedules, repositories and projects. So that looks good. So we're ready, we can give that account to the new user. Actually, now I'm going to sign back out again and log back in as that admin account. Otherwise, we're not going to get very far in this training course with those permissions. There we go. And so it is possible to run services without authentication. Um, so there is a special account referred to as a trusted user account which can be used to provide unauthenticated access to any component of FME server. So by default, this trusted account is named guest and is assigned to the FME guest role. Um, so by default, that, that FME guest role is configured to allow unauthenticated access to the FME server web services, uh, which means it's possible to sort of run a service URL without providing any credentials. So what we mean by that is um, running, a, running a job or running a workspace. So we can go in here, I'll just choose one of the samples to kind of show you what we mean. Um, pick Austin Apartments. Oops. I wanted that to be Job Submitter. And if I click down here under this advanced, um, it's a little bit different in 2019 compared to previous versions. When you share a workspace, you'll end up with a URL to kind of run it directly. Um, so you can see here, this web service URL allows you to run a workspace via different services directly. Um, at the moment, that's got a token in there that was created automatically. But this default trusted user account could run this URL without including that token in the URL, um, basically. Um, so if you wanted to change the username and password of that trusted account for a service, you can go inside um, the properties file for each web service to configure that. Um, so these are located in the Tomcat folder for each of the different web services. Then you can find the properties file properties and set that default user ID and default password to run. And then if you make any changes in a config file, you need to make sure that you've restarted the relevant service. So because this is editing a Tomcat configuration file, you would need to make sure you go into Windows services and restart the FME server web application service. If you had made any changes like in previous chapters to say the FME common config file, you would need to save that and then restart the FME server core service before any changes are going to take any effect. The other thing we support as well is using FME server with Active Directory. Um, so this allows you to connect to an existing Active Directory or LDAP server and incorporate available users and groups into your FME server security configuration. So under security here, there's the option for Active Directory at the bottom. Uh, so you would create a connection to us to um to your active directory you would put in all of these details here um, i don't actually have one that i can connect to 
right now. So I'll just show you what that settings page looks like. And um, you would put all of those details in and then you can import your users to FME server. So the passwords and then membership is going to be continue to be managed by Active Directory server, um, not in FME server. Uh, but you can have FME server users um, and those roles coexisting with imported Active Directory users. Uh, which previously, I think before 2017, when Active Directory configuration moved into the web UI, you could have one or the other. Uh, but now you can have both FME server users and Active Directory users. And um, one thing to be aware of as well is if you've connected to multiple domains, um, if your second domain contains a username that is the same as the first domain, or even possibly if you've got FME server users with the same username that one of your Active Directory users has, um, the second user when you try to import it, um, and you're going to have to give it an alternative name because you can't have people with the same username on, Act on FME server, um, and it is case sensitive, I believe, as well. Um, and while you can import Active Directory roles, you can't modify membership in FME server. So if they belong to a group in FME, um, in Active Directory, sorry, you can't control what group they belong to um, on the other side. So you only have read, read only access for Active Directory. And we do also support integrated Windows authentication, um, sometimes known as single sign-on or SSO. So we can enable Active Directory imported users to integrate their Windows login credentials and just sort of automatically sign in. So there won't be, if you've got single sign-on enabled, there's no need to sign in to the FME server web interface. Instead, you would just select use Windows credentials on the sign-in page and you would get signed in. Um, and you would also see the same in FME Workbench if you're publishing a workspace to FME server. You would be able to use your Windows session credentials there when you're publishing up. You would still need to provide um, your FME server credentials in the HTTP authentication fields if you're using the notification service uh, when you're publishing up. So you would do that when you publish a workspace and you choose which service you want to register it with. And we would be able to do that in the edit service properties dialog button. Then if you do want to enable single sign-on, um, which we're not going to go through today, you can have a look at the documentation. And um, there's a couple of steps here to go and have a look at there. Um, so a new feature in 2018 that came out was the ability to allow users to reset their password and if, they, if they've forgotten their password and can't log into FME server. Um, if a user is signed into FME server and they wanted to change it, um, they can go up to the top to their user settings, change their password here, and they would need to put in their current password and what they want their new password to be. Um, but if you let me enable it, and if you're trying to sign in to FME server and they've forgotten their password, if you've enabled password reset, they would be able to get an email that gives them a link to go and prompt in to generate their new password. Um, so they'll be able to do this as long as you've enabled password reset um, that you've configured and set up a system email account. The user has provided their correct email address or you provided it when you created the user associated with their account and that the user isn't an Active Directory user. Um, because like I mentioned, we are read only for Active Directory. So if they've forgotten their password to sign in and they're an Active Directory user, they would need to go and change their password on Windows or talk to their IT department if they wanted to get their password reset there. And then once they've done that and remembered it, they should be able to sign into FME server. So if you want to enable password reset, um, can go in here under system configuration under the general option. You can enable reset password here. Um, so you would need to configure an email account that the reset password emails are gonna come from. So this needs to be, you'll need to have an account set up somewhere else and put all of the details in here. Um, and if you're doing this, I do recommend using 
an application password rather than just the password for the email account that you would use to sign in in a browser. Uh, using an application password means that your email provider is less likely to get upset about security concerns, that they know an application is using it rather than it potentially looking a bit dodgy if there's lots of sign-ins from a location that they're not used to. So you would put in your sort of system email settings in here um, and then you would be able to save that. You would need to give it um, an email subject as well, maybe just saying something like password reset email um, and you need to give it a public URL as well so that this will be the link um, the password. So the public URL needs to be a place that users can get to when they get their email. Hopefully that makes sense. So when they, like if the user got that email address in their email account, they clicked on that link and it should resolve to where the FME server lives. They should have access to it. Um, and I can't actually save that because I haven't put in an email account there. Um, but you should see once that reset password button is enabled, let's see if this works. You will see when you try to log in on that login page, you end up with a forgot your password button here. So if I couldn't remember my password, I could click on that. You would type in your username, make sure it's case sensitive in here and select to reset password. And then you would get an email through to the email account associated with that user with a link and they could go and choose what they wanted their new password to be. And again, enabling that password reset or reset password is only something a super user can do. Um, it's just something to be aware of. And this FME server is 2019.0, um, but because 2019.1 is being released soon. Um, it's worth mentioning that now under system configuration and general, um, you would only configure one system email. So it wouldn't be configured under the reset password. There would be a se separate option here, system email and password reset would use this system email rather than you configuring it in two different locations. Um, but in chapter, six, I believe. Um, in chapter six, we'll actually look at what this system email account is used for. So password management as well. So in 2019, we added in the ability to enable a password policy. So again, this is on the same page under system configuration general you've got password policy here, so I can toggle that to turn it on. Um, so if you wanted to make sure that users are putting in more secure passwords, you can set some rules up around that. So you can set minimum characters for a password, um, must not contain the username, must contain uppercase letter, lowercase letter, a digit or a special character. So I can save this, oh well, that's already, by default all of those are turned on. I could turn these on and off as I wanted. So now if I wanted to reset my password, um, because we're currently just signed in as the admin user and the password is admin, I would need to put my current password in here and you can see for the new password, now I've enabled that policy, it's given me a list of all of the rules I must adhere to when I'm creating my new password. Um, so I need to make sure it's compliant with that. But if I don't change my password, I'm still okay to sign in with the password I had before. You would only get prompted after turning on password policy if you went to change your password or reset your password. I already showed you how a user can change their passwords um, just by going into the user settings in there. And then another feature that's new in 2019 is this concept of token management. So if anybody is experienced with FME Server and has used previous versions, you may be aware that you could sort of generate one token for your user account and it would automatically have all of those permissions that you have. So if you wanted to 
run workspaces using that direct URL or service URL like I showed a moment ago where you wanted to be able to use the REST API. You could use your token. Uh, but now with 2019, so your token isn't being used maybe in multiple places and has all of your permissions, you can you can create multiple tokens now per user. And each user is able to manage their own tokens. So the way you can do this is by clicking in the top right hand corner in your user settings. Under here in the options is manage tokens. And you can go in here and see what tokens you have. Um, because I created that link to run the Austin Apartments, it automatically created a token which I can now see listed in here. And I can go and manage those or create new ones here. So if I wanted a user to be able to just, just run this Austin Apartments workspace, it's generating a token for me with only the necessary permissions to do that. So you can see here, it's just got that run workspace um, access there. And it will make sure that it's only given access to run that one workspace. But if I wanted to create a token um, sort of underneath my user that could do a bit more, you can load, you can create a new token and give it any permissions that it's needed or that that application or person using that token needs to run. So you can create and manage all of your tokens on this page here. Um, and what we're calling these is API tokens. So these are the kind of tokens that you would create to give to possibly third party applications if they're running workspaces, calling those workspaces directly. Or maybe you're building custom web applications um, that will need to have a token to run services, maybe data streaming, for example. Um, so wherever you need to give a subset of your permissions or sign in and you don't want to use your username and password um, and sort of pass that in in plain text. And then the other type of token that we've got now is a session token. So you can click on the tab across the top to swap between API and session tokens. So every time you sign in to FME server, you're going to get a session token. So you can see here, um, the only place I'm signed into this FME server is on this virtual machine. I've got one session token. You can see this is my active one because it's got that user icon here. Um, if I actually go incognito and try signing in, I'll just take this out. We should see that there are two session tokens once I sign in. Now I'll click my user settings, go to manage tokens, session tokens. Yep, you can see that there are now two session tokens listed because I'm signed in in two different places, but this is my active one here. And I signed in at 924, which is right. Both are enabled because I'm still logged in in both browsers. Um, so that just gives you an idea of where you're logged in. So I could select this one and remove that token. Yeah. So anything using that is now going to stop working. And it will also list expired tokens in here. And um, if you've got them, so you could um, then just go and remove those. But to be honest, you can probably okay to just leave them. Um, so now I signed out of that one. If I go back, if I close this tab now and go back to here, it still looks like I'm signed in because I haven't moved off this page. But now say if I go to the schedules page, it should, because I deleted that session token, I'm sort of kicked out of FME server now and I would have to re-sign in and get a new valid session token. And the other thing to be aware of as well with API tokens is that the only time that that token value is sort of available um, will be when you create it and get that URL. Um, for 2019.1, when you create a token, it will give you the option to download it as a text file. Um, so sometimes it's a bit similar to security with Amazon S3 and those services. If anyone's familiar with those, sort of when you create your security credentials, 
gives you the option to download them as like I think it's like a CSV or an Excel or a text file and you keep those safe and it doesn't store those for you to go and look up anywhere in their Amazon console. Uh, so in 19.1 this will be done in a similar way when you generate your token it will sort of show it you once but you won't be able to go and look up the token by its value you'll be able to look up and configure it by the token name instead so if you're creating these api tokens i would definitely recommend giving them good names and good descriptions so that you can go and manage those again afterwards So that is the end of chapter five, uh, chapter four, sorry. Uh, so hopefully from this chapter, you're now familiar what users and roles are, how you can configure and sort of add new users and assign their permissions, um, share different items in FME server, how you can turn on password reset and turn on a password policy. And you now know about the new tokens in FME server 2019 jump right into performance. Um, so there's two ways you can increase performance. You can add more engines or you can make it more efficient. So the first one is adding uh, engines to an existing machine. That part's pretty easy. Uh, you just up it on the web UI. I'll go down here and show you. Done this before. Uh, so you just up the number and you'll get more engines. Uh, but you do have to pay attention to what you have in terms of hardware. Um, general rule of thumb is one CPU core per engine. That's going to get your, your most beneficial or optimized workflows. Um, if you go beyond that, you're going to see some degradation so uh, or slowing down. So good to know what your capabilities are. Uh, and the next uh, method is to, other than adding more um, external machines uh, with uh, engines on them, which we discussed in previous chapters, is the job queuing. So the job queuing can really help out with uh, streamlining the workflows and being able to get um, more um, jobs through that are important or key or not having small jobs backed up on big jobs. So there's several main reasons. One is keep the data close to where your um, source is. So it's uh, less network traffic there, makes it quicker. Second, if you want a specific format, you can have one engine um, or a separate engine machine with all the third-party libraries or applications on there. And you don't have to install it on all your machines. You can just have one in there, and then you can point any of those jobs towards it. Potentially, you only have 10% that go there, so why are you putting the software everywhere else? Uh, the last two uh, main reasons is, is scheduling you want to make sure those schedules run you want to make sure that they run on time and they're not running an hour late because somebody submitted 100 jobs um, and then having a specific queue for quick jobs is very important for a lot of organizations as well that way you can always assure that you're going to have a job come through or, or, or be processed fairly quickly rather than again backed up behind one of these big jobs So you can assign engines to a queue, and you can also ex uh, assign a repository. So where our workspaces sit, a general folder of uh, workspaces towards a specific queue. Um, there's a queue priority in there too. So the jobs will get a priority when they enter that queue, and it will go to the top of the queue if it has a higher priority. Um, so the, lowest, uh, the highest priority is one. So if it has a one, it's gonna go shoot right to the top. If it has a 10, it'll stay at the bottom. Those are only for that queue though. It's not gonna extend into other queues. It's not gonna have all the ones from other queues running on it, even if they share an engine. Should note that in the past, we used to have a queuing mechanism and it had a scale of one to 200 and now it's only one to 10. So be aware of that. It should be automatically adjusted when you um, upgrade from a previous version. When you restore your configuration, it should be scaled. So we'll look at the job queues here. We'll jump right in. Do an exercise here. We're creating a job queue. This is a scenario here where they have a lot of small jobs that they want processed really quickly. They don't want the backup waiting for a 
database backup or, or upgrade or anything that's going to take a long time. So we'll start here by creating a job queue. So down to the engines and licensing page, configuration. Scroll down to the bottom. We've got a default queue there already. You have to have your engines in one queue or it can't be in no queues. So by default, your default queue is gonna hold everything. So when we create a queue here, we'll do a queue name. We're gonna call this one quick translation. And we have no engines in the queue, we have no repositories, and we've got a default value of five. So we can assign some engines in there, and we see that uh, we have six engines on this. We upped the number previously, although the web UI is not showing. Reverted back. Um, so these are the engines that did exist at a certain time. So they, they have appeared on there in case we weren't gonna scale back up. So we'll just move it back up to the number that we want. And then we can pick one of those engines from here by just editing the queue and you'll see a transfer over. So go engine, we'll just start with engine two, let's say. Um, We've got a priority of five there. Um, and then in the description, uh, let's call this quick translation for small jobs or quick jobs. And we won't bother with a repository for this one. And we'll save it. And we have a new engine here, our new uh, queue. We'll go into FME workspace. We'll create a, um, a new workspace here to publish up. It's all it's gonna be as a creator. It's just something to run and it's gonna run quickly. So let's minimize our Okay, so we'll launch Workbench. Should, the icon should be down there, so you can launch it. Create a new workspace. Add a creator. And then we'll add a logger. We're gonna publish this back up. And if you did the exercise before, you might have a, a web connection in there already. And if you did the HTTPS uh, configuration, we have to make sure that we pay attention to that. So the easiest thing to do is grab it from the browser after launching it, but you can just type it into so localhost. And then we want the port in here too. We'll authenticate, see if it works. Seems to be fine, we'll move forward. Uh, let's create a new repository here. We'll call it uh, training. Great. And then we'll publish this up. We'll say job queue, test job.
So we want to put it, um, register it with the job submitter service. All we're looking to do is run it. Publish it up. We should, before we publish anything, make sure that it actually does run. So you can test that out, make sure it runs on desktop. So it's good practice. Seems to be successful. We'll launch the web UI again. And now we're gonna sign um, and run the job queue. So go up to the top, run our workspace. We've got uh, our new training repository and in there we have our job queue under job submitter service. We'll click on the advanced button here and here you'll see a job queue. Um, there's also a few more parameters here that you can use to control. If you have jobs that are going to, you, you want to be resubmitted or you want to cancel out of the queue after a certain amount of time or a job running time in case you find a job that sometimes gets caught up by uh, a break in network traffic or something that's happening on the other end, and this is a frequent occurrence, you can have a job expiry time on that. For now, we're just gonna pick the new queue that we created, and we're gonna run it. Verify that it completed. We can look at the details here. First check that we can do. And we want to do the transformation. Here we go. So under the transformation manager directives, which is under the requested data, you can see that we have a tag and a queue of quick translation. So you can use the tags which equate to the queues uh, if you're running it from um, a third party application or web application and you wanna use the REST API. So that looks good. The other place to check to see where your jobs have run is um, through the completed jobs. So by default, I'm just going to expand this out. By default, you're not going to see all of the categories, all the columns in here. So we're going to want to add a few of them in. So if you go customize columns, we're going to take the engine, we're going to move it across into the displayed columns, and we're going to take the queue and move that across as well. And now we can see that it ran under the quick translation uh, queue and it ran on the engine that we wanted to. So that's good verification in the end of where your jobs are running. Great, so yeah, we looked at the jobs completed page we successfully made a queue. So, and you can increase the number of engines on a machine, you can increase the queuing mechanisms. These are both things that you can do directly from the web UI to increase your workflow or your capacity to process jobs. But you can also add machines, uh, add engines on a separate machine. Um, you can do this uh, in a complete mixture of operating systems or bit versions. You can have a Linux core and you can have a Windows um, engine machine and they can communicate just fine. So it's quite flexible in what you want to do there. Um, and that flexibility also lends itself to having specific um, operating systems for formats. So if you want to stay in a, in a Windows, you, sorry, you want to be a Linux shop, but you do need to use ArcGIS occasionally. You can have a Windows machine with just an engine on it. Uh, we talked about keeping the data close to the um, close to the source there. 
that's going to be beneficial for increasing your performance of those jobs. Uh, the FME core uh, and web server, those components I'll, I'll touch on too. Most cases, we are really concerned with the engine. That's going to be where your bottleneck is. So if you have uh, problems uh, with capacity, that's going to be almost always your engine. Your, your core and your web server can handle a lot. The only reason we would want more of those is to create the fault tolerance system. We'll move on to versioning. So we've got workspace versioning. This, this came about in 2018. We've got a couple different ways of doing the workspace versioning. Uh, it will in terms of being able to connect to a remote repository or be able to just use the inbuilt. Um, you can, it, it's a very useful tool if you have uh, certain phases of a project that you want to work through. Uh, you can keep them all there on the server. Um, the rollback uh, isn't a, um, is a two-step process where you have to uh, download the workspace and republish it again, but it's always there and you can see what changes were made. So the version control, again, sits down the bottom under our system configuration, our general, we've got our version control. And both on the workbench or when you publish something up to FME server and on the server web UI directly, you have uh, the ability to commit at both those points. So here's an example of where we're publishing it. You can see the commit button right there. You can add in the version. You can add in um, some more comments about it. Uh, at any point to or once it's up on server, then you can add in a version as well. You do have, again, the ability to use a remote Git repository if you want to. Uh, there's steps on how to do that um, on our documentation. So we'll hop into uh, versioning a workspace array. So instead of having an organization try to backtrack, find out where they were uh, change the workspaces, what version, what happened. We want to move back to something that was working well for us previously. It's much easier to do now you have versioning. So we'll go through that right now. So we'll log in to the web interface. Again, we've got the HTTPS on 8443. We'll move down to system configuration, general, and then we'll expand the version control out and turn it on. We're not going to worry about a remote repository or a token associated with right, that right now. We're just going to turn on the default version control. Going to head back to Workbench. And we can use the same workspace that we had before. Maybe this time we're just going to have a creator and no logger, so we can just delete that one out. So we've got a super simple workspace. Run it. It's all up to date. There's no caches, so that's why that's going. So it was successful. We always want to test it before publishing to server. So we have our uh, web connection in there already. And we'll, uh, we'll push it up to a version test repository.
call this one version control test. And before we do anything else, we're going to commit this. We're going to add to version history so we can see it on FME server. And in here, we're going to add a little history. Uh, you can add any notes you want. Uh, version is generally most important. All right, so now that should be committed. Uh, we can continue with the publishing of it. And then from there, we can go find our repository. So we created this new repository version test. We can take a look. I'm going to expand out my uh, application here. So if we scroll right over, we can see a history button. So we'll select our control here. Shorten this up. Look at our history. We've got our workspace here, We've got the, our comments, anything that we want in there. That looks great. So from there, if you wanted to download that version, what you can do is download it directly from there. We've already got it open. We don't necessarily need to do that. So what we'll do is use the workspace that we had previously. We'll change it. It's important that you have a change in it. If you don't have a change in the workspace and you try to commit it to a new or a new version of it, it's going to reject it. So we'll go back to our workbench. We'll add something in there. Let's add a logger. And then we'll try to republish it back up. So we're going to edit and republish the same workspace. Same URL we're republishing to. And then we're going to not commit it this time. We're going to commit it once we get to FME server so we can select the workspace we had previously. I was going to change the name of it. So it just gave a warning saying that we're going to overwrite the file, and that's fine. We don't have an issue with that because we have the old version already there. I'm just going to put the job submitter service again, register, register it with that. And we'll go back to our repository, version test. Click on the workspace and look at the history. So we just have the original history in there. 
So let's take this one here that we just republished. You can see we just republished this one. This isn't the original now. You can see that it was altered by my publishing event. Let's commit this one. And we're going to add in some information here to say it's the second version. So with FME Server 2019, you can have some system events that, that it get triggered. So anytime anyone uploads um, a new workspace or replaces a workspace, he can send off and you can have a process that will send off a notification to an administrator or someone in charge of that group of workspaces who can then go in there and update this versioning. So you can make sure that no process happens in your workspaces that isn't documented um, because of this validation process. We'll commit that and we'll go back to version test. Now let's click on our version control workspace, look at the history, and now you can see that we have two versions of it, both which you can download. So again, you have to make sure that your workspace differs if you're going to create a new version of it, otherwise it will reject it. Um, we should have learned how to enable version control here, um, controlled it from Workbench during the publishing process, controlled it after publishing it, and uh, you can see how we can download and republish old versions. So we looked at job queues, we looked at adding engines to existing machines, we added engines to new machines, we looked at those for expanding or improving performance, uh, we looked at job routing um, and prioritization within that job routing as well. And these, these combined, I mean, the first step is always to make sure that your workflow is not holding anything up. So job routing first, then add some engines on some machines, and then expand out to new machines. So there's a lot you can do before you really have to expand or spend any more money. Chapter or chapter six to go through, and um, before we get to a brief section on troubleshooting and the wrap up, just to finish off this FME Server Administration Training Course. Um, so this last second to last chapter, chapter six, is about customization and monitoring of FME Server. Uh, so the first thing we're going to have a look at in this chapter is FME server dashboards. Um, so this dashboards panel is used to display reports that can show the general health of FME server in your installation. Um, so we actually have five reports by default that come with FME server. You can um, additionally create your own if you're interested. Um, and these dashboards that we give you by default are failures by workspace, daily total running time, daily averaged queue time, daily total jobs, and the average running time. So these just show you some statistics based on like jobs that are running on your FME server. Um, and you can see in the training manual here, um, these appear as simple, they're, they're static HTML files. Um, so clicking on any of the links to any of these dashboards, if you've got them enabled, will open up this sort of HTML file in your browser inside the FME server window and display that report. So this is just one example of the job report, daily total jobs ran on an FME server, and it will show you like which days the jobs had ran. You can hover around the different points and it'll give you the value for that day. Uh, so where you can find dashboards in the server web interface is on the left hand side at the very bottom um, of that top section in the menu bar you can click on dashboards um, and in the beginning they need to be configured to start running um, you do have a link this takes you to a fme server documentation about dashboards and getting uh, started with them so there's a link here um, that gives you a bit of information about what dashboards you can expect to see uh, when you turn this on. Um, and the way you enable this is it you set a workspace to run on a schedule or you can run it manually, um, which is a job history statistics gathering workspace. Um, so all of these dashboards are behind the scenes 
powered by FME workspaces. So the job history statistics gathering just basically goes into the FME server backend, pulls all the information out that it needs and writes it locally, I believe. And then from that workspace running, it's set up using the notification service. So the other workspaces will run to generate the dashboard reports. Once you've collected all of that information, the job history statistics, um, the workspaces to create these dashboards can then run and create those HTML files. And it actually publishes those HTML files into the resources folder on FME server. So you can see here, it will actually put them inside one of the dashboard shared resource folders. So if I flip back to FME server under resources, you can see there's this dashboards folder here. And then what it would be doing when you're viewing your dashboards is just basically loading in the HTML files from here. So if you did want to create your own dashboards, what you can do is create your own workspace. You could maybe download and inspect one of those other ones um, just to see how it's done and build your own report and then get the dashboards to be written out into this folder. And then you can view some more statistics that you're interested in as well. Yep, so there's just some steps here as well in this training manual on how you can get your dashboard panel working and how you can update those. Um, so you can either follow the steps in here or you can, if you're interested in setting this up on your own FME server, you could do this. Um, you could use the documentation to set that up. Uh, so by default, I think it comes with a schedule. Let's have a look inside the schedules section on FME server. Yeah, so by default, the installation will come with two schedules. I um, mean, here one is for doing backup configuration, so you could set this to run. By default, it's set to once a day. You could go in there and edit this and change it. And as well, the dashboard statistics gathering schedule, you can go in here. Um, you could, if you wanted it more or less frequently, you could choose the repeat interval um, and you could set this up to enable it. Um, one thing you would need to make sure of or something to be aware of is if you have configured your server for HTTPS or SSL um, and you've set this verify SSL certificates to yes, if you're using a self-signed certificate, there's a good chance that the HTTP caller, which is inside the workspace, the job history statistics gathering workspace, won't be able to verify your SSL certificate because you signed it yourself. It wasn't signed by a certificate authority. Um, yeah, that workspace may fail and you won't get any dashboards. So I would just set that to no in that in that instance, um, unless you do have a certificate that's been issued and signed by a trusted certificate authority. Um, so I can press OK here. There's one of the other useful things in 2019 actually that's probably worth mentioning here is say you had this dashboard statistics gathering schedule set up to run once a day. I'll just turn that on um, at the moment. Um, but say this is set to run at midnight and I actually I'm impatient and I want to be able to see my dashboards as of right now. You could select this and trigger that schedule and it basically means it's going to kick that process off running now manually and it'll still keep running at midnight every day. I haven't had to interfere with my schedule timing to change that. So that's a useful little feature um, that's in 2019 now. Um, and we can go and have a look, just have a quick look at what that job history statistics workspace is doing. Um, so wait for that. Takes it a while to load the first time you load the workspace viewer in here. or whenever you want to demo this live, it doesn't work. Um, but wherever you have workspaces through and you see those binoculars, you that will open that in the workspace view and you will be able to have a look at what the workspace is doing. Uh, but I believe what this is doing, there's a HTTP caller inside that workspace, which is going off to use the FME server REST API and bring back all of, those, all of that data um, and then write that to FME server so the other workspaces can use it.
So that the next thing we'll have a look at, I did briefly mention system email earlier. Um, so this is sort of new with the new system events and password reset that we have um, is the system email. So in 2019.1, as I mentioned, you'll basically have one place to configure system email, which is here. Um, currently in 19.0, which you can see on these machines, password reset when you enable it still requires you to configure an email account here. Um, so now in 2019.1 and hopefully going forward, you'll only have to do it in the one place, which will be the system email part here. So what this system email account is used for is system events, um, which we'll actually get to on the next page. Um, and then, yeah, if more and more things appear in FME server that require a sort of system email account where users would be getting an email as if it's from FME server, you would just configure that in this one place and it would use that system email account here. So I can explain what system events are. Richard did briefly mention or sort of hint at system events when he was talking about workspace versioning. Uh, so in 2019.0, we've added system events to FME server and this makes it able to publish messages about significant events related to administrative tasks. And these are the system events. So by default, when you're configuring your system events, um, you can set the notification up to be an email and it will be sending that email from your system email account, which you've configured here. So you can get access system events at the bottom here under the admin panel. And I'll just click on configurations. And you can see we've got a list here of available system events. Uh, what we've got, and you can see them all listed in the web UI here. Um, there might have been a couple of new ones added for dot one off the top of my head, I couldn't say. Um, but you can see there's things like database connections. Um, there's also ones for um, like repository items, if it's created, deleted, updated. Um, you've got new users as well, if users are created, updated or deleted. If there are any warnings in your FME server logs or any errors in your FME server logs, you can see those up here. You can have a system event when your FME server starts up and turns on. So all of these different events here are enabled by default when you install FME server 2019. You can go and disable them if you're not interested in knowing when these things happen. Um, but what you can do is if I wanted to be alerted every time there was an error in my FME server logs, if I've configured my system email, I can enable this send email notifications and then I'll choose who I want to send an email to when there are errors in the logs. I'm um, give it an email subject if I want to write my email in HTML or text and what I want the body of that email to be. Um, and now in 2019 as well, we have this text editor view for things. Um, similar to in Workbench, if you wanted to edit parameters, you could bring up the text editor box. You can do the same now in the server UI. So if I wanted to add some information about that system event, maybe say what the error is, um, I could include that in my email body. Oops. So you can do this for as many um, system events as you want. You would just go in and each one, once you click on it, you can enable that send email notifications and fill in all of the details here. So if you want to monitor your system events as well, um, you want to see what's been going on, because they're all enabled by default, you maybe don't want to receive email notifications for all of them, but you might want to just go and check in to see what's going on on your server. You can click on the history tab on the top right, um, and then you can see everything that's been going on on this server. So you can see from the exercise that we did in the previous chapter, where we created that new user, you can see that that's been recorded as a system event. You can see all of the logins that I've done on this server. You can see when my VM turned on, 15th of June, that's when we started it. Um, errors in the log file. And so it just basically allows you to go through and see sort of what has been going on 
on your system and what's being recorded based on what you have enabled in your system events. So hopefully most of the people on this training course have attended an FME World Tour event or have been to um, Herbalist watch one of our webinars. Uh, so just by a show of hands, if you haven't, um, so if you haven't been to a World Tour or watched one of our 2019 unveiling webinars, do you want to just raise your hand? I can see if there's anybody that's missed that. Okay. There's a few people. Um, so hopefully all the others that have attended webinars and or World Tour events have seen this feature already, but it's a pretty pretty exciting one for 2019 if you're an FME server user as well as administrator. Um, so we have automations now. So previously we had the notification service which allowed you to sort of start to automate your workflows, watch for things to happen either in or outside of FME server and then do something based on that. So for example, you could have a directory watch and when something appeared in a directory that would then start a workspace running and then maybe when that had succeeded or failed, you could connect that to a subscription, which would send an email out afterwards. Um, but doing that in the notification service wasn't the easiest. It can be a bit time consuming and it take a little while to get your head around it. So now in 2019, we've added automations. So what this allows you to do is set up a trigger. Um, so basically, FME server will watch for something to happen. So you've got a list of different triggers here, which you can see so an emails incoming, um, if like directory watching is going on, scheduling. Um, but one of the things that administrators have that FME authors don't have access to is the ability to use system events as a trigger in an automation. So when the system events um, sort of management part of FME server, you can turn on email notifications, which we saw you can send an email when a system event occurs. Um, but if you, you're setting that up sort of per system event, so that could get a bit time consuming if you're always going to be emailing yourself for all of these system events. So what an easier way of doing that if you wanted to send an email based on multiple different system events is create an automation set the trigger to be system event received and then you've got a drop down here and you can select as many system events that you want to receive an email notification for so i'm just picking a bunch at random here that i want to be notified for so i'll press apply here and then it's really easy i can choose to i've got this guided mode on which you can enable or turn off up here. And which just prompts me when that system event occurs, I need to add an action to it. So I could run a workspace from that, or I could just add an external action straight away. So I could add an action that's gonna send an email. So now every time one of these system events that I've selected here happens, it's gonna send me an email. And I've just configured that Okay, well, admittedly, I haven't finished configuring this. I need, could put on all of these details um, and I would need to write my email body in here. Um, but all of those system event information is available to use in here. Um, I've now configured sort of email notifications for, um, how many is that? Like, I'm gonna guess like 15, 20 system events at once in the time it would probably take me to do one if I were doing it the manual way using system events. So if you do want to receive notifications from system events and sort of be kept up to date with what's going on on your system, definitely have a look at automations and using system event as the trigger for those automations. I mean, you don't just have to send emails, you can have a look through um, the list of actions that are available as well. So the next feature we'll have a look at is system cleanup. Uh, so this is available under the admin panel on the left hand side. I'm going to leave that automation, I don't need to save it. Um, so what you'll find is if your FME server is used heavily for a long period of time, or maybe just used fairly frequently over a long period of time, 
um, you can get quite a buildup of files um, and it will use your system resources. Um, so either it will be like resource files, if you've got multiple types of log files or job history records, these could get fairly big. Um, so these are cleaned up automatically by FME server using tasks defined on the system cleanup page of the server web interface. So you can see here, I've just opened up that system cleanup page by going under the admin panel, clicking on tasks. You can see all of the different system cleanup tasks that we have here. Um, so if I just make this a little bit bigger so you can read this a little bit easier, it's doing a lot of deleting things. So like deleting log files, deleting temporary files, job logs, um, but it has a max age, so it will only clean them up once it gets to that time. So off the top of my head, this is in seconds, so I'm going to guess the 86,400 seconds is around a week. But don't quote me on that because I haven't got a calculator to hand. Um, if anybody wants to do the math and let me know, that would be useful. Um, but you can configure that as well in any of these. So deleting, let's click on delete core logs and have a look. You can choose what folder you want to delete, choose if it's enabled or disabled. You can add filtering in here. Um, so if you wanted to see if something ends with or doesn't end with a certain name, maybe there are certain files you don't want to get cleaned up, you could turn on filtering. Um, oh, okay, yeah, it was a week. You can remove files older than and you can choose what time period you want to use. Um, but on that page, this sort of task page, the max age is displayed in seconds. But when you configure it, you have useful um, sort of time periods to choose from. Now we can just explore these are the options as well. Um, so you can see a few other things here, um, scheduled cleanups. So it looks like every, every week it's gonna clear out job history if it's for more than a week. System event history will only last a week unless you change this. And those expired session tokens, which I showed earlier, are um, automatically gonna get removed after a week. Not too sure why you would maybe wanna keep those around unless you wanted to check to see where and how often people are logging in. And automation logs are, or automation log messages are kept for two weeks. Uh, but you can go and change any of these or enable or disable them. Then on the last page, you've got some configuration options as well. So I think by default, they will be based off those timings. So after so like a week or a few days, they will get cleaned up. Uh, but you can also set um, disk conditions too. So under normal conditions, those cleanup tasks will run every day and just check and remove anything that's older than those time periods. Um, if you've got low disk conditions, so you're running out of resource on your machine, uh, those scheduled or those cleanup tasks are going to run every five minutes. If you've got low disk and default cleanup, um, that's going to trigger when there's less than 20 gigabytes of disk space left and the minimum disk space falls to 20%. Um, and then low disk, you can have an aggressive cleanup. So that will be when there's less than 10 gigabytes of disk space and the minimum disk space falls to 10%. So you can just do some extra um, configurations in here. So I think when it's um, when it reaches any of those, it will just start cleaning up rather than um, waiting for those time intervals. So I have seen before a customer had a case where they were trying to use dashboards actually, and they were running the job history statistics gathering workspace. It was triggering all of those dashboard workspaces to run to generate the dashboards and the HTML files, but the dashboards were never appearing. And those jobs were running successfully, but what was actually happening, they had such low disk space on their machine when FME server was writing out those HTML files for the dashboards, cleanup was being triggered and it was cleaning them out because um, I guess the dashboards um, weren't considered 
like critical if they disappear you can run a dashboard again and get it back or write it somewhere else it's not a huge drama if that gets scored and it's cleaned up so just something to be aware of if you're finding things on your FME server are disappearing quickly where you think they should be written maybe have a look at your system cleanup and I believe this is logged in the FME server log file um, go and check to make sure and see if your cleanup task is running if it's not in the FME server log file, there will be a service or a task log specifically for system cleanup. Um, yeah, I see someone did the math for me a lot quicker and wrote in, so thank you. <laughs> if I tried to get my calculator out while I was trying to present, I'd probably have got distracted. Um, that's okay, so that's system cleanup. Uh, so the next section, configuring custom coordinate systems or grid transformations. Um, so I think at the very beginning of the course yesterday, um, this is kind of mentioned in the workspace requirements. If your workspace needs some of this stuff, you need to make sure that FME server has access to it as well. Um, so if you want to use custom coordinate systems or grid transformations, um, you'll need to put these up to FME server and there's three ways that you can do this. So you can use the resources page of the FME server web interface. Um, so this makes uh, custom formats, custom transformers, custom coordinate systems available to all workspaces on FME server. Um, just if you're using them, you'll probably need to make sure that you're referencing them and the right location. Uh, you can publish them to FME server um, and it will publish to the same repository that the workspace is in. So it will be next to that workspace. So if you are, um, say you have a, I'm just gonna say repository A. In repository A, you have a workspace that uses custom coordinate system and grid transformation. Workspace A is gonna be able to use that no problem because it's in the same repository. If you have repository B, which has a workspace B in it, um, that's not gonna be able to use that custom coordinate system from workspace A. Um, unless you, I guess, explicitly tell it where to go and find it. But otherwise, it would use, if it's published with it in the same repository, it will just use it. It will know where it is. So you've got, yeah, you can publish it directly to FME Server itself, or you can publish to FME Server with the workspace. Um, <clears throat> and you can either put it, it, by default, it would put it in the repository next to the workspace, or when you upload resources, you can choose where you want it to go if you want to specify a different location. And then if the custom coordinate system files are uploaded to any of the applicable engine subfolders, um, the FME server engine service must be restarted before they can be used in a workspace. So if you're uploading anything into the coordinate systems exceptions folder, coordinate system grid overrides, coordinate systems, and the CS map transformation exception subfolders, uh, which you can see here, you need to make sure you're restarting the engine service before you expect a workspace to be able to use those. So next we have using Python with FME server. Um, so if you're running workspaces on FME server that reference Python, the FME engines must know which Python interpreter to use. Uh, so if you're building workspaces in six, 2016 or later, the interpreter is determined by setting the Python compatibility workspace parameter. So you can find that inside the navigator. Uh, if you're using previous versions of desktop before 2016, which hopefully no one on here is, you should definitely upgrade to 2019. Um, then you would need to specify that um, Um, hang on, I've just got myself lost now. Yeah, for, so if your workspace is more recent than 16, you do it in the navigator. Um, if you're using an older version than that, then you'd probably want to check the documentation and check where you're setting that. So when you publish it up to FME server, the engine knows and is able to use the right Python interpreter. Um, so there is documentation here of using Python with FME server. So open that link. Um, so this will tell you, I believe, where you would want to 
put those. Um, so if you are uploading Python, custom Python interpreters to your FME server, have a look at the documentation and make sure it's going in the right folders. And then for 2018.1, Python 2.7 is deprecated. I believe if you do still need Python 2.7, there is a prompt in the installer to ask if you want it installed with it. So if you do, um, then just be aware when you're installing FME server. If anybody here uses R with FME server, which is a statistics package, and um, if you're using any of the R caller transformers in your workspaces, um, you're gonna need to make sure that R is installed on all machines that run FME engines. So I guess you need to make sure you install R and then install the SQL DF package for R as well. Um, or you can uh, look at the documentation if you need to tell FME server to look for the R package in a non-standard location. So adding shared resources. Uh, so the resources page is a convenient way to store and access the following. Um, we've already had a look at some of these. You can, you can store your backup files in there if you want to, um, but I would recommend, like we talked about earlier and yesterday with backup files, if you've made a backup of your server in case your server goes down, maybe not a great idea to keep it on the same server, just in case something catastrophic happens to that machine. If you've lost FME server, you've also lost your backup if it's on the same machine. So definitely recommend keeping your backup somewhere else. I mean, you could keep it in both locations, but definitely keep a copy somewhere else. Um, and then you just keep your dashboards on there. Any data that workspaces might need, it's a good idea to publish those um, to the resources folder and keep them in here for the data. It's a lot easier to manage and keep track of your data if it's in the resources and don't just publish it into the repositories with your workspaces. You've got the engine folder, so for anything extra you might need, like those plugins, the custom coordinate systems, etc. Um, you've got all of these shared resources here. As if you wanted to create, uh, upload files and folders, you can go into, I'll go into the di uh, data directory for example, you can either create new folders or you can use the upload button to upload files or folders straight here. Uh, so this dialog or uh, these buttons available should be the same wherever, whatever sort of folder you're in inside the resources. I mean, you can also create new network resources. So you can do this from the web interface from 2018. I believe before that you would have done that in the configuration files. Um, so you will need to make sure that the FME uh, web application, the FME server core, and the FME server engine services, um, which we saw in the Windows services, are running as a domain service account that have the correct network access permissions as required. So you'll need to make sure that that service account running those services has read and write permissions to that location. And that's something to sort of like double check and triple check a lot of people will uh, come to support because things aren't reading and writing properly. And then normally it's just a case of permissions that they weren't set up correctly for that domain service account to have the right access to the right folders. So that's something to just be aware of and double check. So from that main resources page, you can click new in the top right, give it a name, um, sort of like a back end name, a display name that people would see in the UI description, and you can choose what type of resource connection you want. You can point things to an S3 bucket or a network-based resource. So you would be able to sort of, these things would appear in your resources as if they're part of FME server, but they're actually just sort of viewing things wherever they live, either if they live on S3 or in a network resource. Then you can see here in this screenshot, it would look a bit like that once you've connected that external resource. If you want to share resources, um, say if you've created a folder inside data with loads of stuff in, you need to share it with someone else on your team. You can click on the share icon, which would appear next to a folder, share with others. And this will allow you to type in a name of someone. Um, and it also shows you roles as well. 
So you can either share it with specific people or you can create a role and share it with a group of people. And you're also able to choose what permission they have for that folder as well. So database connections. Um, so you may be familiar in Workbench if you're a desktop user, when you're authoring workspaces that are connecting to a database, you're more than likely using a database connection. So it's sort of like saving your username and password in this sort of like drop down list rather than having to embed and type in your connection details every time you want to read and write that same format. Uh, so when you use a uh, workspace with a database connection and you're publishing it up to FME server, it will allow you to publish that database connection with it. So then that would live on FME server. Um, so again, if you're running a workspace on FME server that requires a database connection, it will give you a drop down of any database connections that you have on your server that you can access. Um, so the way to have a look at what database connections or web connections you have, on the left hand side here, you've got connections. Under that drop down, you can click on database connections. I'll just make that a little bit bigger. Um, so if you had any here that you've published up with a workspace, you'd be able to view them. Um, but you can click on new. If you wanted to create a new one, you can give it a name choose what type of database you wanted to connect to. And then you would put in all of the connection details here. And then when you were running a workspace, it would give you the option to use that database connection. Um, or you can get a database connection up here by publishing it up with a workspace. And then if you did have a database connection set up on here, you wanted to edit it, you would just be able to select it choose the edit button and go in there and change any of those details. Maybe if the port changes, for example, or something like that, or the host name changes, I guess username password would have been in a better example, um, but basically you can go in there and change any of those parameters. You can also share your database connection with other people, um, just in the same way you're sharing things, sharing other items on FME server with other users. And again, you can create and edit your database connections. You can also remove them. So you would just select any of those database connections that you wanted to get rid of and then click the remove button at the top. And then web connections, pretty similar to database connections, both types of connections. Uh, instead of storing database connection information, um, they store web connection information. So you'll normally, um, it will have like details of the web service that you're connecting to and a username and password. Um, but before you create a web connection, you would need to create a web service. Uh, so you can click on the manage web services button here. And then if you any web services that you had on FME server would be available here. So for example, if you were trying to think of a good one that you would connect to, uh, maybe like Arctis Online, say, um, that's quite a popular web connection. You would have a web service for ArcGIS Online that sort of defines how FME is able to connect to ArcGIS Online. And then your web connection would contain all the information about like username and password um, and et cetera. So if I actually have Workbench on this machine, I can kind of show you the difference in Workbench as well. Um, so there's two different ways you can add web connections to FME server. Uh, probably the easiest way is, um, the way I normally do it would be, if I'm using the web connection in a workspace, I'm publishing up that web connection with the workspace when it goes up. And if it already detects that web connection is on your server, it won't keep republishing it, it will know that, so you don't have to publish it up again. And the publishing wizard will be able to detect that and tell you at publish time. Or if you've already got a web service definition up here, you can use the web UI to create a new web connection. Um, then if you are creating these, there's some information here about authorizing a web connection. Some services, once you've published them up to FME server, will require you to authorize it. So I guess that that third party or web service knows and accepts that 
it's FME server that's going to be interacting with it. So that's something to be aware of um, in there. So if you wanted to configure a web service definition, there's some information in here. Um, and I believe, um, at least for desktop anyway, there's, a, there's an example on how you would do this for Fitbit. Um, so you could always check that out if you're interested in this. Um, so if I open Workbench up actually, go under FME options, um, web connections. So this might, this might not actually be a very good example because I don't have any connections that I've created on here. Um, but if this loads, if not, let's see. See if Workbench will open on this screen from my computer. Okay, you can manage the services here. Um, so you can see all of these here are the sort of web service. Or if I do it here in preferences, web connections. You can see I've got a lot more here. Uh, you can manage the services, which is sort of all the information. You have to give it a client ID, a secret, a redirect URL. But these are just like the web service definitions that you have. And then any connections that you created, so I've got a bunch for FME server, but then use those service definitions to create that connection. Um, so you need to make sure um, if you're creating these that you're aware of the difference between them. Uh, but definitely check out the documentation if you're interested in that. So let's bring FME server back. So that's the end of the chapter on customization and monitoring FME server. So you've had a look at quite a few things in that section. Um, we started off with dashboards. If you wanted to display reports about your sort of general server health and sort of see statistics on jobs. Uh, one thing I should probably mention at this point is sort of the dashboarding tools in FME server are fairly primitive. And if you wanted to use something a little bit more elegant. I know some people here have been playing with something called Prometheus. I don't know whether anyone listening to the webinar is, has heard of Prometheus or uses it, um, but we are adding endpoints to the REST API for 2019.1 for that, which allows you to connect those services to FME server. And I think it gives them the data and statistics in a format that those systems understand. So you can sort of use a better tool for dashboarding rather than these. Um, but if you're happy with just viewing the HTML reports here, go ahead and do that. If you want to get a little bit more high tech, it might be worth having a look at 19.1 when it's released, I believe, at sometime in July and something like Prometheus. Um, and then the other things we looked at, sort of all basically, um, components that a workspace will need to run and how you get those on FME server. So things like custom formats, transformers, coordinate systems, uh, Python interpreters. If you're working with R, um, had a look at system events and system cleanup. Um, so I believe as well for system events, if there's anything you're not seeing um, for the system event side, um, purely for administrators, um, that kind of system event do let us know on the knowledge center i believe there is an idea or a q a post about this so if there's anything that you think would be really useful as an administrator that you haven't seen already do let us know um, how you can share resources with other users and database and web connections so hopefully now after that chapter you're aware of the different ways that you can sort of customize and monitor your fme server and you could go away and do that yourself fairly easily. So now um, chapter seven is quite a quick chapter on troubleshooting uh, because obviously as administrators if you're the one setting up your FME server system I guarantee you you're probably going to be the one that your FME server users are going to come to if something goes wrong. So some initial troubleshooting steps we've got here. Um, Obviously, there's the classic sort of IT line, turn it off and on again. So you could try restarting your FME server services. 
and also try rebooting your whole machine. Sometimes that's enough to fix things. Uh, use the task manager and have a look for any processes that may still be running or hanging and kill them off. Um, and then maybe do a restart or check for those orphan processes after you've restarted just to see if anything is being left behind. And obviously I guess the big one is if something stopped working, what changed recently on your system? So that might be in um, one sort of place where system events comes in handy. So it's like, I haven't signed into my server, I haven't done anything. You can check in the system events and actually looks like you did sign in, you just published a new workspace, perhaps uploaded some new data to a repository. You can start to get a better sort of view of what's going on on your FME server. And I would say the next place to look is if something is not quite right with FME server, have a look inside the log files. Um, we're pretty good at logging things in here. Um, I guess the challenge is knowing which log file you want to be looking in. Uh, so if in doubt and you're talking to support, I would normally ask people just to zip up the whole log file, log folder, maybe minus the job logs unless it's a specific workspace issue, and send them over, as it can sometimes be a bit easier to look through things that way. Uh, but typically if something is going wrong with like FME server core, main functionality of FME server, or any configurations that you've been doing to FME server, things like Active Directory, um, look inside the core logs. So I believe in there there's an FME server log, there's an FME server core process monitor log. Those are probably good places to start to begin with. Um, you want to be looking inside the engine folder if it's something specific to running jobs or engine trouble. So I can just sort of go inside this logs folder now and show you what we're kind of looking at. So for core, anything FME server main functionality would be in the current folder if it's recent. Um, you can have a look in there. If it's related to notification problems, publisher subscribers, that's all under there as well. Um, engine folder has anything to do with jobs. So you'll see all of your job logs are inside the job folder. And then logs about your engines will be here, how much you can have a look at. It's very rare that you would probably need to have a look at the server queue log file. Uh, we can have a look and see what's in the service folder here. So again, go into current. Um, so some of these different services, um, so like the job submitter service, data download, data streaming, the log files here if you're having a trouble with a specific service or the REST API. Um, and then Tomcat is basically anything to do with the web application server. So if you're not seeing things appear right in the web UI or even sometimes REST API errors can be useful to go and look inside the Tomcat log folders, inside those log files. And as well, if you're doing any configuration for HTTPS, um, because all that configuration is done directly to Tomcat, um, and that's an Apache Tomcat configuration, not specifically an FME server configuration, um, have a look inside the Tomcat log files and that should give you the warnings and help you start to troubleshoot and fix any issues. I so say what you're looking for inside these log files is in forms you can normally ignore, um, they might have information but if something's probably not working you're probably going to be looking for warning or error. And I think inside the Tomcat log files as well you want to look for severe if anything really bad's gone on, you'll see a severe um, error message. So you can go through and have a look. Normally, Control F, download the log file, open it in the text editor, and Control F is the easiest way to find out what's going on. I and mean, I guess I should mention back on, I think it was this one. Um, the server experts that say you've have um, tried to put together. Um, sort of a fairly comprehensive troubleshooting guide. So we've got like a main landing page here with some more generic troubleshooting steps, things to start to have a look for. Um, and then we've got more specific pages depending on what you may have been doing. So if you're trying to configure for Active Directory and you're seeing issues, you maybe want to check out the Active Directory troubleshooting guide. HTTPS SSL is a really good one as well, um, mainly because I wrote it. Um, no, in all seriousness, some of these things can be a little bit tricky to configure if you're not familiar with them. 
So anytime a customer comes to us or we see issues, often we're trying to add information to these troubleshooting guides to make it easier for users to get up and running again. So again, like here, we've got common Active Directory configuration errors and then what you can do to resolve those as well. So definitely recommend checking out on the Knowledge Center um, as well for your error messages. Um, and I go back to that page. And again, in here, we've got some additional troubleshooting information you could always use as another reference if you're finding that something isn't isn't going to plan. Yep, so we've just mentioned as well the Knowledge Center or the FME community, um, it's now called. So we've got an extensive collection of articles and Q&A postings on there. So typically if we find something um, that appears a lot, we may write an article on it. It's a little bit more in-depth information. Um, not quite at documentation level, but we're normally either telling you how to do something or more detailed information on an issue. Um, or as well, we can and a lot of users will post questions on our Q&A forum. So if something's not quite right, you can post on there and then you've got FME users all over all over the world and our FME partners who know what they're talking about able to post answers on there and help other people out, which is a really great resource. Um, so we've already mentioned the troubleshooting guides. Um, as well, if you do find anything that you think is a serious problem, something isn't working as expected, um, you can click on the report a problem and raise a support case direct with us. And like I mentioned before, if you are experiencing issues, it's a really good idea if you're raising a support case to include as many logs and screenshots of the issue as possible to make it easier for us to help troubleshoot and diagnose it. So that brings us to the end of this FME server administration course. Um, so now we'll just go through the wrap up section, uh, which is fairly quick. Uh, so just a bit of information about product information and resources. So we obviously have safe.com is our website, um, which has a lot of information on there about what FME can do. Um, yeah, all about what we're up to at SAFE, what FME is about, what FME can do. If you need to get in touch with support, we have our support page as well and all the different ways you can contact us. Uh, so if you wanna ask a question, if you wanna know how to do something in FME, go to the community and ask a question on our Q&A forum. You can suggest ideas there for product enhancements if there's anything you want to see. Um, we also have live chat available between nine and 12, one and four Pacific time. So if you've got any quick questions, you can come on there and just chat with us. Um, I don't really know how many users on the training have bought FME through a partner or a reseller. Um, so we have those all over the world. So if you've purchased through them, those would they would be your first point of contact if anything has gone wrong with your FME. Um, I also have a blog as well. So right. I think fairly frequently try to write articles and push articles up to the blog. They're a bit more interesting. And um, you can check those out. I've got the documentation, which hopefully as administrators, you're familiar with reading the documentation for FME server. And then the community and knowledge base, which I've already mentioned. So, we are regularly updating this training course and um, we've actually recently just finished updating this to 2019. Um, so we've tried to include as much 2019.1 content in this training course because it's so close to release and I believe if you're going to be installing and setting up FME server soon it would be useful for you guys to know what was in 19.1 in case something in there is worth maybe waiting an extra month for. Um, do let us know any course feedback that you have um, either in the comments through the Q&A or I believe there will be a feedback questionnaire. Um, so there is a link in the manual to the feedback form, uh, but you will be reminded, you will get an email reminder afterwards, let us know. Um, so if there's any exercises you think would have been useful to go through, just allow you practice, let us know so we can get this updated when 19.1 is released before we do the next training course, which is probably in the fall. Um, and you should also receive a certificate as well, which will get emailed to you.